Let us now have a look at the next two sections of emergency management, the reactive and proactive approaches. Starting with reactive, this means to act in response to a situation rather than creating or controlling it. Now we know that the best form of safety management is preventative and proactive. However, there are situations that will arise in which we will need to react in order to minimize the damage or exposure. Now since we may need to react, you should ensure that you prepare for any emergency situation. The providing of first aid is a reactive form of emergency management. First aid is the immediate treatment of a casualty, someone who is ill or injured. A first aider is the first responder to the scene, so rendering assistance is key for the survival of the casualty before the emergency medical services arrive. There are three principles to first aid. Preserving a life, preventing the condition from becoming worse, and promoting recovery. Firefighting is another form of reactive emergency management. Our emergency management plan may also need to include a fire safety plan. Please ensure that you include all key contact information, utility services, access issues, dangerously stored materials, location of people with special needs, the connections to sprinkler systems, your layout, drawing and site plan of the building, maintenance schedules, as well as personnel training and fire drill procedures. Evacuation is another form of reaction in emergency situation. Emergency evacuation plans are developed to ensure the safest and most efficient evacuation time of all employees and any who may be affected by the situation. When developing your emergency management plan, the most important method is proactive approaches. Now the definition of being proactive is creating or controlling a situation rather than just responding to it after it has happened. So prevention is better than cure. A proactive approach to health and safety as well as emergency management can potentially save a life. Now why do we say this? Well because preventing an incident or accident before it happens can make all the difference to you and those who work with you. Let us now take a look at these proactive methods by looking at the specific emergency procedures and how we need to go about developing them. It is no secret that one of the best methods to preventing minor incidents and accidents in and around the workplace starts with good housekeeping. Housekeeping also includes good lighting, good ventilation, hygiene facilities that are clean, aisles and storage areas that are clearly marked as well as properly stacked. Stacked goods must never endanger the life of any person. All yards, outside areas as well as vehicles should be kept tidy and all refuse should be placed in the appropriate bins. It is important that all plumbers know and understand the risks associated with poor housekeeping. Good quality housekeeping is also vital when working at heights to avoid the trip, slip or even fall hazard that could result from working at heights. Cables should never be placed across a walkway. Electric cables should be taped down to prevent tripping. Ensure that all access routes, especially fire escape routes, are clear of debris at all times. Never leave items laying around on the work site. Clean up use the right tools and make sure that you always wear the right and appropriate PPE. Each person is responsible to ensure that his or her workplace is clean at the end of each day because everyone has a responsibility towards safety. Our best defense against any emergency situation is a proactive approach. Slip and trip hazards are often caused because of poor lighting, trailing cables, unsuitable floor coverings, uneven or damaged floor surfaces, contaminated floor surfaces, as well as poor housekeeping. 
you must do your part to proactively prevent incidents and accidents from escalating to becoming an emergency situation. Effective housekeeping extends past just the working environment, all the way to the road and your vehicle. Please ensure that you remove waste materials from your vehicle and keep it clean at all times. You never want to be distracted by debris inside your vehicle or even possibly causing you to be unable to maneuver your vehicle in an emergency situation. Housekeeping is not just cleanliness. It includes keeping work areas neat and orderly, as well as maintaining your vehicle so that they are free of hazards. An emergency procedure or an emergency response plan should always follow a specific sequence. In this instance, we look at firstly detecting what the emergency is. In the detection phase, we need to identify what is the emergency that we are facing. This will help us to make a decision. The decision to fight a fire, provide first aid, evacuate or call emergency services must always be dictated by the emergency coordinator. Once the decision has been made, the alarm can be sounded. You will then sound the alarm for fire, evacuation or a different type of alarm based on the emergencies that you might have within your company. It is good to remember that each alarm needs to be specific to the emergency procedure. You never want to sound an alarm for fire and have everyone evacuate only to evacuate to where the fire could be. You also would never want to have an alarm for everybody to remain where they are because of a bomb threat and then they end up evacuating. But you also don't want to have an evacuation alarm and have everyone sitting where they are because they are not sure whether they need to evacuate or stay in place. This is why it is so important to have fire drills regularly and to specifically identify which alarm means what reaction to take. Now your reaction time is also very important. From alarm to reacting to getting people safe is very, very important and that needs to be kept to the least amount of time possible. Another good reason to practice and train on fire and emergency drills. During your reaction, the emergency team need to know what to do when hearing that specific alarm. Do they need to grab emergency kits, fire extinguishers, or do they need to start evacuating the building? From here, the next sequence would be moving to an area of refuge or assembly station. This assembly point should first of all be known by every single person and be easily accessible so that your route of exit in order to get to a safe destination or a safe assembly point must be easily available for every single person. A roll call should also be taken at the assembly point so that you know who is there and who is not there in case you need to go back into the building and do a sweep of those who potentially could still be inside that building. This is why it's important to know at any given time who is in the building and who is not in that building. This is a very difficult one that you're going to try and have to figure out how you as a company are going to adhere to this. Then your last sequence is transportation. Does anyone need to get to a hospital? Does a fire or ambulance need to get into the building? Or can an ambulance get through to you where you currently are? Transportation is very important and nobody should be getting into their personal vehicles to try and move in and around the premises because this could obstruct emergency services. The most important thing you can do during an emergency situation is remain calm. We use the RACE principle during evacuations and this will even help in the event of a fire. Let us have a look at the example of the RACE or RACE principle for fire evacuations. R is to remain calm and do not panic. Rescue persons in immediate danger and then sound the alarm. Activate the alarm to start the reaction sequence. C is to contain the fire at the point of origin by closing all doors and windows and E 
evacuate the facility using established procedures. Remember, the RAC principle can be used for many various types of emergency situations. Please ensure that you use this type of principle carefully, identifying clearly what the steps or sequence is for each emergency situation. Use this fire evacuation as an example for your emergencies. Being prepared is your best defense against any emergency. To manage an emergency, you must use the prepare principle. Pre-plan of the facts. This is a plan of action before you start. Your resource availability. What type of emergency management tools will you need, such as what type of fire extinguishers will you need for specific fires? You will need to evaluate your and others' capabilities, what you can or are not able to do. Then set your priorities. Remember to save a life above saving property. Assign alternatives. You may be able to do something yourself, but at times you will have to get professionals involved. Do you know who those professionals are? What is going to be their scope of authority and how are you going to contact them in an emergency situation? Then recovering from your mistakes and improving your capabilities. This is why it is so important to constantly practice and renew your knowledge regularly. And then the evaluation results. During a test or a emergency situation drill, we can see what happened before the drill, during the drill and after the drill to learn valuable lessons that will help us in an actual emergency. Is the decision to evacuate the premises? Then you need clearly defined emergency routes. Your emergency plan should clearly identify the following. The route to the exit, which must always be clearly marked and unobstructed. The location of first aid facilities. The location of any shuttle valves for gas, for instance. The location of firefighting equipment. The location of the assembly point, of the alarms, as well as the local contact numbers for emergency services. Maybe ask yourself the question, where are you sitting right now? Do you know the location of your nearest exit route and where the location is of your assembly point? You will also need to contact professional emergency services outside of your company. This is why it is important that everyone should know what the local contact numbers are of the emergency services. These should be clearly and conspicuously placed so that it is easy to find. Do you have the number of your local fire department, traffic department, ambulance service, civil defense service, flying squad, bomb squad, or even the local police station? Along with these emergency contact numbers, your emergency plan should clearly outline not only who the local emergency services are, but how to cooperate with them. What actions need to be taken during specific emergencies. Make sure the emergency plan is simple so that everyone involved can understand it. Make sure that it is practical and can be activated quickly without causing confusion or panic. Ensure that it is coordinated with the local security or other professional services where possible. And please ensure that you test and exercise a fire drill or emergency drill periodically. Multiple persons as well as situations need to be managed during an emergency. This calls for effective emergency plan coordination. The emergency plan must be controlled from a central point. A chief coordinator should be appointed. It is of utmost importance that when an emergency situation arises, every member of the emergency team knows exactly where to report to and who to report to. Instructions from the chief coordinator must be strictly adhered to. Here are a few things that need to be managed. First aid and medical services, firefighting, evacuation of personnel, rescue of personnel, 
the isolation of services such as electricity, gas or other fuel supplies, as well as different engineering requirements. In order to coordinate well, you need to plan and test the emergency procedure. Practical exercises must be held to test the practicality and effectiveness of the emergency plan, as well as to make necessary changes if needed. It must be done discreetly so as not to cause a panic. The objective is that the execution of the plan must become second nature to those involved. Remember, the location of emergency equipment is vital to the emergency team in all emergency situations. So every member of the team and staff should know the location of the fire alarm, the emergency alarm, the first aid equipment, the firefighting equipment, or any other necessary equipment needed for any emergency situation. It may be difficult to recover from an emergency situation. And in some cases, it takes a long time to fully recover or restructure in order to ensure continued business operations as well as safety management. Let us look at a few tips that can help you to plan, do, check and act. This is to plan for the recovery. Do what you say in the plan. Check to see if it is current and appropriate and then act on any deviations you find. First, you will need to understand how each emergency you may face will affect you and your company. Then you will need to note down how the impacts can be mitigated. This should always be a part of your emergency management plan, as well as what will be needed in order to recover from the situation. We are just going to look at two facets, the operational side as well as the financial side. Let us say for instance that there was a fire emergency and it caused the following. Burns to an employee who needed to be hospitalized and booked off for a month. Damage to tools being worked with, such as a grinder and the toolbox. Then there was damage to materials being installed, such as the geezer. There was damage to the client's property, a wall was burnt and the paint is damaged. There was the use of two CO2 fire extinguishers, the use of certain first aid box items, downtime on site, as well as a delayed installation. Because this affected your company on an operational side, how do you get back to working? From an operational standpoint, you would need to get another employee who is able to do the installation. You will also need new tools and another geezer. The additional work of fixing and painting the client's wall would add to the time frame of the project, but can be accomplished at another day of full operation. At this stage, you might say, I already have all of this, so I can continue work without too much interruption. Other companies with smaller staff, less stock, and perhaps no insurance may not be in the same position. So planning is essential. Let us now look at the financial aspect. We understand that there are costs to incidents and accidents. There are also certain financial budgets that may need to be put in place when things go wrong. Now in the case of the fire that we mentioned earlier, let us look at some rough things that may cost the company. Things like the incident on duty costs. And here we are not just talking about claiming for compensation, but the time included the fuel expenses, or any additional costs in order to claim for compensation. The replacement of damaged tools. The cost to replace damaged geezers or materials. Perhaps purchasing new paint and equipment for the repairing of the damaged wall, including the cost of labor. The replacement of refilling the two fire extinguishers that were used. The replacement of the items in the first aid box that was used the loss of income due to downtime, as well as the loss of income due to delayed installations. We would never want an emergency situation to cripple our business. From an operational standpoint and a financial one,
planning for a recovery is vital. So how would you go about planning for this type of emergency? Well, let us look at a few tools that you have readily available right now. The first is legislation. Remember, practicing good safety habits and behavior is your best defense against incidents and accidents from occurring. On the other hand, should an incident occur, we have the compensation for occupational injuries and disease. This is to ensure that each person who faces an incident on duty gets the care and treatment they need. You can then have your own short-term insurance. These would help with the costs of replacement of tools and materials. Then you must have your own safety budget. Your budget will include things like fire and first aid equipment. Then constantly build on your own company's client rapport. When clients see that you are safety conscious, that you plan and prepare for emergency situations, as well as have a proactive approach to safety management, they are more likely to allow your company to return to work after an emergency happens. We never want an emergency situation to cost us the life of an employee, the company itself, or even the clients we work with. And so don't rely only on the financial aspect. A company's reputation for occupational health and safety, as well as advanced planning for recovery, will go a long way in leading for a more productive business. Now that you have planned to use the tools at your disposal, you need to check if they are still sufficient. A satisfactory outcome of planning would be to check if the planned course of your action would result in a favorable solution. For instance, do you currently have COID? Is it up to date? And do you have all the necessary information and documentation readily available to make the process smooth and efficient? Ask your insurance company if they actually cover each type of incident and accident that you may face. Will they still pay out if it is found to be an error on the company's side? Do you have a proper safety budget in place? Or is this done only when it may be needed? And then, will your client allow you to return to work after an incident or accident has occurred on site? This will largely be based on your good reputation for occupational health and safety management. You may be thinking, why is reputation so important? Well, if your client sees that you had safety under control and that all your minimum legal compliance was in place and being managed, they are more likely to give you the needed time to resolve the incident and recover from the emergency. If you are known not to have any safety standards or not to take safety seriously, then the client may prefer that you do not continue with the installation, but rather suggest getting another provider in, resulting in the loss of the entire project or installation. To ensure that you have the best chance of business and safety continuity after an emergency situation, you must ensure that you take safety seriously. Regularly identifying key areas of improvement will keep you and your team safe. Proactively manage your occupational health and safety to avoid emergencies, but also plan for the management of and recovery from emergencies you may face. Remember, you are not alone in safety management. Get the help you need by reaching out today.